Welcome to 311, the Fukushima, California Connections, a series of interviews with activists in commemoration of the ongoing disaster that began 13 years ago this day. Our hearts go out to the people of Japan who've been so horribly and permanently impacted by this tragedy. It was Japan's triple meltdown that triggered production of our featured documentary, SOS, The San Onofre Syndrome, Clear Power's Legacy. Making SOS has been a 13-year production process aimed at trying to help prevent a similar tragedy in California where two coastal nuclear reactor sites and three radioactive waste sites are in earthquake and tsunami zones, just like Fukushima. We've been lifelong advocates for nuclear safety, so 311 has special meaning for us. In this program, we will explore some of the aspects of the Fukushima disaster that have developed during these past 13 years. Kathy Iwani has a bicultural family that fled their home in Japan to avoid the effects of Fukushima, only to relocate near San Onofre, where she joined the campaign documented in our SOS film. Kathy translated for Japanese Prime Minister Naoto Khan when he spoke in the pivotal meeting that helped shut down San Onofre. Kathy is now in Japan, just 300 miles from Fukushima. Thanks for joining us, Kathy. Please give us your perspective on the Fukushima disaster. On this 13th anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi accident, I'm soberly reminded that when my family and I huddled around the TV um, amidst our own um, lengthy, lengthy um, aftershock earthquakes in our area of Wakayama, which is uh, 380 miles southwest of the Daiichi, Daiichi reactors, we huddled around the TV and we were... Um, it took them literally uh, uh, three weeks to start um, in various talking head circles, talk about the word melt down or melt through. Of course, the very first days until the hydrogen explosion, which blew the top off, um, everyone was saying, oh, you, there's no danger to public safety. Doesn't that sound familiar? Same thing that happened at Three Mile Island, same thing that happened at uh, just every, literally every accident or leak in, in the world. Um, so we were witnessing this on TV. Now, fast forward 13 years, I'm reminded of the ever-present necessity for continued activism. Uh, my own personal experience, um, my family was here. We, uh, we were shocked to find that despite being uh, having our own, and we're very lucky, our fish supply sort of has, we're sort of protected in an area called Seto Naikai. And so that was one, one reason that we felt semi-protected when we thought about the after effects of what would happen to our food supply. That was my first thing. How am I going to source ingredients for my children? Um, in the ensuing weeks after 2011, we had radiation soil specialists come with scintillators for the city and they took soil samples. And indeed there were as far away as we are due to typhoons and tsunami and winds and, and what have, have you, normal weather patterns. We did have uh, rises of radioactivity seen in the soil. Um, so then it became really, really apparent how are we, are we going to source food here in Wakayama because the contamination was at a minimum but it was there was evidence of contamination so um, you know it was really really hard I was teaching full-time at my daughter's school down the road and it's a really wonderful system it's very rare where they would leave a, an English curriculum to a foreigner but I you know, had a great relationship with them. And it became apparent that um, 
we would be really smart after researching the ingredients um, that were being sourced for our school lunches. I did some research as a PTA member. I thought I was doing due diligence as any mother would want to know. And I found that over 60% of the ingredients were being sourced within an 80 mile radius of the Fukushima reactors. And so I said, well, to the principal, we were friends. He used to come to our house. And I said, you know, wouldn't it be smart? I don't want to be alarmist, but wouldn't it be smart if we could invest or do a fundraiser for scintillators so that every mother and every family can rest easy that one meal a day, the school lunches, their their food is safe. But and by ja when I mean safe, Japanese food contamination standards are 12 times stronger than what's allowed in our the, there's actually radiation, acceptable la levels of radiation that is allowed in the American food system. And it's 12 times more lenient uh, than is in Japan. So the hard part for me was that the principal just said, oh my God, don't share your research with the PTA by all means. And that was like a stake through my heart because I thought, wow, you are such a good friend. I've worked with you for years and you're telling me not to share this with the other mothers because it would create panic. Now, if that's happening in rural Japan and Wakayama, I could only imagine what was happening, um, you know, closer to Fukushima in Tokyo and North uh, Eastern Japan as a result of the control of the narrative and censorship, et cetera. So that was one, uh, one thing that really, really, uh, prompted me to drop out of the school lunches. I started sourcing sourcing near organic ingredients, and I told daughter's teacher, I said, "Look, we are just bringing um, our own lunch. We're dropping out." And she said to me, "She said, well, okay." And then she asked my daughter, "Why are you doing this?" And my daughter said, "Well, my mom, you know, she's like a fourth grader." My aunt, my daughter said, "Well." I, my mom says we're allergic to radioactivity. She was joking, right? And so the teacher actually had the nerve to say to my daughter, um, do not tell your classmates what you're telling us. And that right there was my moment then, if you were gonna call it anything, I thought, how am I in good conscience raise my kids in this society that is sort of, um, the party line is, is indeed affecting um, food culture at the schools here, 380 miles away. So that was one of the issues that really got us thinking about expanding the girls' horizons and, and leaving Japan, which we ended up doing the very next year. Um, another thing that really, really a terrible um, event happened, and this is very specific to Japan, when something bad happens, some terrible tragedy, it's a simple thing because everyone works together. There's this group consciousness that you don't find in many other places in the world. And that can be beautiful, but it can also be a terrible thing. And what I experienced was the, the leftover radioactive debris uh, left from the nuclear accident. We're talking about uh, concrete, steel, just soil. We're talking about huge, huge piles of, of, you know, tons and tons of uh, debris that was radioactive. Japan came up with a policy that they would share the burden with the rest of Japan. And what they did is they, it was a nationwide strategy or plan to share this burden by selling that debris, not selling, by paying municipalities all over the country to please accept the debris and incinerate it in your waste, um, your waste uh, disposal tent. Now, that sounds like a beautiful thing if there were filters, but there are no filters on any of these waste um, incinerating uh, centers. And so, you, after a lot of research, we found in our study group that a lot of these uh, waste centers are situated near schools. They're situated near crops. We're talking about a country and waterways. We're talking about a country that with all its islands together measure the size of California, if that. So they're very creative with uh, managing land space. Um, city planning is completely different than it is in the United States, which is understandable. So when that came to our 
front door. It came to our, it literally not, you know, not figuratively that whole um, incineration came to Wakayama city hall. And I'm very, very lucky that my husband um, has a background in politics, very close to the mayor. We were able in two short weeks to mobilize the friends and citizens of conscience really were following this whole thing. And we marched to the city hall said, look, here's a petition. Here's a worldwide petition with the whole world. The eyes are on Japan saying, please stop this incineration of radioactive rubble. And so we were lucky. We were able to um, prevent that from happening in Wakayama. And they signed a declaration. That's beautiful. The sad part about this is that that very incineration was to continue the very next year in 2012, one expressing hour away from us in Osaka. And not only that, it continued throughout the country. So it's it's often said, if you're going to source tea, green tea or fish or kelp or whatever, even to this day, uh, common sense tells me to source it from as far south as possible. But we know, science tells us that, come on, the Pacific Ocean and fish, it doesn't just stay in this one area of Japan. We know and we've found contamination on the shores of California. So that was something that just uh, was another reason for our evacuation. And the hard part about the evacuation is that, look, we are say, I mean, so blessed. We have the choice to say, you know what? Let's go to a place where our kids can be about this and not be told shut up. Let's go to a place where we can, um, let's go, let's go home to California where I'm from. And, and I, at that point I was under the impression that we still had a good sense of democracy <laughs> and that, um, you know, we would not be as censored and for the kids' education would be uh, more fruitful. Lo and behold, we uh, sign a lease to Solana Beach, in Solana Beach, which is North County, San Diego, in California. And as it as the stars align, or as luck would have it, or I can say terrible luck would have it, the day after I signed the lease, I found out that a nearby power plant, San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, they call it Songs, was um, had a radioactive release um, that they there was an alert for, and of course the powers that be said it was minor, but this was due to um, terrible uh, terrible replacements for um, steam generators. So, not only did did I evacuate my my kids? leaving my husband in Japan to support us for seven years. That's very traumatic. I'm gr grateful we're able to do that because not a lot of people have the choice to be able to do that. And we know that by watching um, what happened to the evacuees in Japan, uh, in Fukushima. We met so many that came to even Wakayama to safety. And here I am having the choice to evacuate my children, you know, out out of Japan and finding ourselves 35 miles south of um, a failing nuclear power plant. So um, as luck would have it, I guess the stars aligned and I became really, really active in the San Onofre effort to shut down, which was a, um, a decades long effort that I just happened to join at the very, very end. Fortunately, we had a good outcome there, and now we're dealing with the waste. But um, if you have any detailed questions about our story in Wakayama, oh, another thing you would you would expect being 380 miles of the, the reactors would be safe. And of course, in a certain sense, we were safe. However, you'd be surprised to know that at our children's gymnasium, and this is crazy. Our community is a fishing port here, right? This village. And that school, our daughter's school, there was about, at that time, 100 kids that attended Wakaura Elementary or Wakaura Elementary uh, School. And we were shocked to find that in the day, two days after the actual tsunamis, 
500 people had evacuated from this local sea level, their homes here in our village, to the uh, gymnasium of our kids' school. So that's how how bad the reverberations of the waves and the tremors, earthquake tremors were um, were felt in our area, which is quite a ways away. So I guess in conclusion, I'd like to say that, that um, as advocates for peace and sustainable energy, the onus is really on us, regular citizens of conscience to continue telling our personal stories of family devastation by disease and evacuations due to the Fukushima accident. It's on us to tell our stories to policymakers and to give voice to marginalized communities who are silenced by the media and by the nuclear industry. It's the onus is on artists to screen films telling the stories. Um, it's on musicians and poets to publish their personal recollection. It's on writers to document and publish their history. Um, it's on orators to speak publicly uh, to the next generation and to create awareness uh, to those who are just not aware. Um, activism must continue on a large scale or people will forget as they have done and history is bound to repeat itself. So I thank you um, for reaching out. Oh, good. I'm glad thank it wasn't for... a PTSD moment. <laughs> no. No. That... It's, it's very valuable and we really appreciate your taking the time. To yeah. talk to of us. course, of course. I'm so glad that our schedules coalesced and um, yeah. we wish you the best. Yeah, we got you just in time. So yeah, well yeah. done. Excellent, Kathy. Really Thank you, great. Gary. Thanks for everything you guys are doing. And um I'm I'm praying and uh sending good juju for more awards for SOS and more awareness and more uh this will all tie in to even if we don't get our hot cell tomorrow, it's gonna tie into something. I can feel it, even if it's just awareness on a broad level. That's that might be our our role in this whole thing. But even if I say just that, it has to be the spark for something at San Onofre, right? Yeah. Right. Right. It's a That's great true. attitude. Thank you. We want to introduce our friend Gary Hedrick. Gary co-founded San Clemente Green with his partner, Lori Hedrick. Gary's been a key organizer in the successful campaign to shut down the San Onofre reactors and is continuing to work on the campaign to manage the plant's tons of high-level radioactive waste safely and responsibly. Gary, thanks for joining us. San Clemente Green started as an environmental group to create a sustainability action plan for San Clemente. And by the time we had completed that task, we were approached by people who worked at San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, and they were concerned about a process replacing steam generators. And they felt that because of time and money behind schedule, they had to forego the testing. So the engineers contacted us because they were fear, in fear of retaliation from management. And we promised to keep their identities protected and learned a great deal about these steam generators, but nobody would listen to us. We'd go to the city council. They said it's not in our jurisdiction. We've got um, issues with people who work there. Or employment in the town really relied a lot on Edmonds. Um, power plant there. So it wasn't until the unfortunate accident in Fukushima that people actually started to listen to us. And the, uh, the timing of it all just was so overwhelming to be silent, everyone else we approach, and then all of a sudden in the spotlight with the news and people wanting to cover what does San Onofre think about what's going on in Japan. And, it was really a kind of a not just a wake up experience to how bad things can happen, but it's also a wake up experience to how good people can be in a crisis. And probably the 
my most fond memory of the whole incident was soon after the accident, we were being contacted by people in Fukushima that wanted to warn us what they're going through so that we didn't go through it. Because we're in the same situation. We've got tsunamis, we've got a little tsunami wall, we've got uh, earthquakes and all kinds of similarities in proximity to the ocean that um, they're just impossible to not make that connection between San Onofre and Fukushima. So as a result of opening new relationships with friends in Japan and participating in protests here to keep Japan safe, and also them protesting here with us and sharing their stories to keep us safe, it was really a beautiful thing. But the ugly side of the story is what the industry does and making people afraid to speak up, share the tr truth because fear of retaliation and the, the systems and the status quo are not set up to handle such a huge crisis and to watch it unfold in the way it did was very disheartening because the harder we tried, it seemed like the more challenge and pushback we get. People didn't want to hear the truth. They didn't want to understand what risks we're facing, just like Fukushima. So if it weren't for whistleblowers, nobody would have listened to us because only uh, two years after they warned us in 2010 about the steam generator replacement project, the steam generators failed. Radioactivity was being gushed into the atmosphere right before our eyes. And th the denial was from the start. Nothing to worry about. You know, there's a little steam, no radiation. A few days go by. Well, there's some radiation measurable, but nothing to worry about where Eventually, the story just kept getting worse and worse until they had to finally give up and not restart these defective reactors. So it's, um, it's a real eye-opener to the way the system works and the way it doesn't work, the way people work and the way they don't work. Um, there's so much more to uh, this problem from a personal perspective than would ever be known in the media or in the news. But that's why I'm so pleased to be able to hear, be here and share the story with you in conjunction with the release of the new San Onofre Syndrome documentary, because that's 12 years of information that several different groups and people brought forward that would have been lost in history forever if it were for a documentary like this. So the documentary keeps the story alive, keeps it alive for us in San Onofre in Japan and at every other nuclear site in the country or in the world. It's the same story and it's the same situation where the regulators and the industry are working together to, to concede whatever the industry wants and the public raising concerns are portrayed as fear mongers and chastised and told to go away. But in the looking back on it, I'm so proud of what everyone did. Every role in this whole relationship between San Onofre and Japan turned out to be not only effective, but everlasting. Because I'll never forget the bonds I have with the people that witnessed and tried to protect us from what they're going through. And I feel the same to the people who live here. I want to make sure understand who to trust, what the risks are, and get down to real honest, transparent, analyt analytical science to understand the best way out of this because <clears throat> we're in a situation that will eventually lead to Fukushima if we don't do anything different. And by doing things different, that means don't put nuclear waste 100 feet from the ocean at groundwater level and expect things to go okay. So now we have to create more impetus, more, more momentum to handle the nuclear waste properly. 
And in so doing, I hope we can set the example for the rest of the country and other parts of the world that have the same thin temporary canisters that we have and uh, make it so future generations will have a chance to solve the problem. The, the point I really wanna leave you with is that the relationship we started with Japan 13 years ago continues today. It'll continue forever because those bonds, they created an obligation for us to continue story forward with our generations that are facing a similar threat. And eventually it will happen if we don't change course today while we still have time. It's gonna require people to listen to the message, not be afraid and turn their back. Uh, if you see something, say something, be brave like the other whistleblowers that saved us and continue to be positive and determine that this story gets out because it's not, not just a tragedy. It's the story of overcoming incredible odds because we have thin cancers that are not gonna last forever. And we have a short time to fix that problem. And the only way we're gonna do it is together. So my hopes for all of us is that we learn to cooperate, be honest, transparent, and make the right decisions that aren't just based on profit. You think about safety and compassion, not just for the people living today, but the ones that us. Thank you. Very well spoken. Thank you so much for watching and being willing to learn about this tragedy and hopefully taking action as a result. We want to learn from history, not repeat it. Please help spread the word by hosting an SOS screening in your local community. And to learn how, please visit our website, sananofresyndrome.com. SOS will be available for viewing online beginning in April and has already been named Best Educational Documentary in the International Uranium Film Festival and won Awareness Film Festival's Grand Jury Award for Feature Documentary. Thank you for watching.